So far, we've treated competitive markets as if they operated in a vacuum, isolated and disconnected from all the other markets. But in the real world, markets are connected in all sorts of ways, and so it's often a mistake to focus on a single market as if that market operated all on its own. One example of this involves markets across geographic regions, which gives rise to the topic of trade across markets. Consider, for example, markets for corn. There may be one market for corn in North Carolina, where the demand curve comes from North Carolina households and the supply curve comes from North Carolina farmers. And then another market for corn in Iowa, with the demand curve coming from Iowa households and the supply curve coming from Iowa farmers. Now, it turns out that it's a lot easier to grow corn in Iowa than in North Carolina. And so if these two markets are disconnected, then the equilibrium price in Iowa would be lower than the equilibrium price in North Carolina. But if the markets become connected, that can possibly be an equilibrium. Think, for example, if it's possible to drive a truck from Iowa to North Carolina filled with corn. Well, in that case, if you own a truck, you can see an opportunity to buy low and sell high. That's what economists call arbitrage, buying low and selling high. So if we indeed had di two different prices across the two regions, and there were people with trucks, then not everybody is doing the best they can given their circumstances, so we're not in equilibrium, because the people with trucks can make themselves better off by buying corn in Iowa and shipping it to North Carolina and selling it there at a higher price. So what would happen in these graphs? Well, as the trucks arrive in Iowa to buy corn, they would shift the demand for corn in Iowa. They wouldn't shift the demand from Iowa households. That would stay right where it is. But they would shift overall demand by buying a bunch of corn and putting it on trucks. So this demand curve will shift, putting upward pressure on the price in Iowa. But of course, they don't consume the corn that they put on the truck. They ship it to North Carolina in order to sell it. So they're going to add to the supply of corn in North Carolina. The supply from North Carolina farmers doesn't change. But in addition to that, the trucks coming in are going to shift that supply curve. And that's going to put downward pressure on price in North Carolina. Now that's going to continue to happen as long as there's a difference in prices between the two regions, at least so long as the transportation cost is sufficiently low. So in the new equilibrium, it has to be the case that the price that emerges across the regions is roughly the same. So once a single price emerges across the two regions, there's no more opportunity for arbitrage, no more opportunity to buy low and sell high. And so everyone will once again be doing the best they can, given what everybody else is doing. We are in a new equilibrium. And this is an application of what we call the law of one price. The law of one price says that you have, if you have the same good in different regions, and it doesn't cost a lot to ship the good across those regions, then in equilibrium, a single price must emerge across those two regions. That's what's happening here. The price, as a result of the trucks going from Iowa to North Carolina, is going to fall in North Carolina, and it's going to rise in Iowa. As a result, North Carolina farmers are going to cut back on how much they supply, because their price has fallen, and so we move down along the supply curve for North Carolina farmers. North Carolina consumers, on the other hand, are going to increase the quantity that they demand because price for them has fallen, so we're going to move down the demand curve to find the new quantity demanded. In Iowa, on the other hand, the increase in price is going to move us up on the supply curve, causing Iowa farmers to supply more corn. But Iowa consumers are going to slide up their demand curve and consume less corn at the higher price, so the quantity demanded in Iowa is going to fall. So in Iowa, we're going to have an excess supply of corn. More is produced than people in Iowa want to consume. But that excess 
is loaded up on trucks and shipped over to North Carolina to fill the gap between the quantity demanded there and the quantity that's supplied by North Carolina farmers. So now we can ask, is this good for North Carolina? Is this good for Iowa? Well, we can analyze that by thinking about consumer and producer surplus. So let's replicate these graphs. We'll have Iowa on the right and North Carolina on the left. North Carolina households forming a demand curve that intersects with the supply from North Carolina farmers at a relatively high price. Then in Iowa, we'll also have a demand curve, this time from Iowa households, and a supply curve that crosses at a lower price. The lower form price tells us that a single price is going to emerge on the trade, which will be a higher price than what would have existed in Iowa had there been no trade, and a lower price than what would have existed in North Carolina had there been no trade. So now we can think about what's happening without trade and what's happening with trade. And we can start with North Carolina. What about consumer surplus in North Carolina? Well, initially, North Carolina consumers face this higher price. Their consumer surplus is everything above that price up to their demand curve. So that's this area A. Once trade happens, the price in North Carolina falls. So the new consumer surplus will be everything above that price up to the demand curve, which includes area A, but it also includes, includes area B and C. So after trade, we'll have A plus B plus C in consumer surplus. What about producer surplus in North Carolina? Well, initially, farmers in North Carolina got this higher price. Their surplus is everything below that price down to the supply curve, which includes area B, but also this area D. So B plus D would be producer surplus in North Carolina without trade. But once trade happens, the price falls in North Carolina. North Carolina farmers produce less. Their surplus shrinks to everything below the new price down to the supply curve, just area D. Now we can add these up for the total surplus in North Carolina. It would be A plus B plus D without trade and A plus B plus C plus D with trade. So total surplus will have gone up by the area C, that triangle here. What about in Iowa? Well, in Iowa, we can look at consumer surplus. Without trade, consumers faced an initially low price. Their consumer surplus is everything above that price up to their demand curve. So that would include the area E and F. After trade happens, the price in Iowa goes up. So now consumers buy less at the higher price. Their consumer surplus shrinks to the area above the new price, up to the demand curve, or just the area E. What about producer surplus in Iowa? Well, producers initially got this lower price. Farmers had to sell at the low price. Their surplus is everything below that price down to the supply curve, which would be this area G. But after trade, the price in Iowa goes up. North Carolina farm, I mean Iowa farmers, produce more corn. Their surplus increases to everything below this new price down to the supply curve, which includes F and G, but also this area H. So we get F plus G plus H. So for the total surplus, we just sum up consumer and producer surplus. Without trade, we have E plus F plus G. And with trade, we have E plus F plus G plus H. So in Iowa, we gain the area H 
as a result of trade, this triangle here. So what we're finding is that total surplus as a result of trade increases in both North Carolina and in Iowa. But that doesn't mean that everybody wins from the trade. After all, prices fall in one place and prices rise in the other. Consumers like falling prices and don't like rising prices. Firms, or in this case farms, like rising prices but don't like falling prices. So in North Carolina, the prices are falling, which is good for consumers, so consumer surplus increases. But those same falling prices aren't so good for North Carolina farmers, so producer surplus decreases. In Iowa, prices increase, which is good for Iowa farmers. Their producer surplus is increasing, but not so good for consumers whose surplus is decreasing. Trade across regions, therefore, does give rise to some people who win and some people who lose. But since overall surplus is increasing in both regions, it means that in both regions, those who gain are winning more than those who lose, lose.